Hey, you bit Steve from that old Yorkshire Geek, and it's list time again. Yay! It's one of my lists that will be exclusive to my Patreon for a couple of weeks, and then it'll pop up on YouTube at some point in the future. So, list, list, the, the list this week, if I learn to speak, whatever, uh, is seven best Star Trek characters at speaking techno babble. Now, techno babble in Star Trek terms is when it's what it sounds like. It's when they say something that sounds technical and scientific, but most of the time in reality, it's just gobbledygook. <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, reverse the polarity of the neutron flow, that old Doctor Who trope. You know, it doesn't really mean anything. I think that just means turn something off and on again. Uh, so here we go. So I make myself titchy tiny uh, down in the corner of the screen. Uh, if I can find me thing in my bobs, here we go. I'm recording this in stream stream labs, as you may guess. <laughs> I'm a bit a bit too small there. I make myself a bit bigger. There we go. Right, I'm gonna get the article up. This is again you, what usually are from Screen Rant. Here it is. Rachel Hulshult wrote this one. Seven best Star Trek characters at speaking techno babble. And there we see uh, Mr. Spock from the original series, uh, Lieutenant Commander Data from Next Gen, and Michael Burnham. Michael Burnham, best at speaking techno babble. I mean, the techno babble in Star Trek Discovery is genuinely nonsense. <laughs> it is, at least in the original series, particularly in Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, etc. The Burman era, the techno babble. Was kind of convincing, even if it was, you know, essentially nonsense. Right, anyway, off we go. Star Trek's dialogue is often riddled with techno babble, and certain characters have mastered the delivery of this science jargon more than others. The term techno babble refers to the language used to describe the science and technology of Star Trek's far future and how that technology works. While some of the techno babble is at least somewhat based on real contemporary science, much of it only makes sense within the context of the Star Trek universe. As Starfleet engineers and operations officers deliver these complex lines, they often have to provide clarification for their less science minded colleagues. Techno babble is not unique to Star Trek, as many other science fiction television shows. Uh, and movies create their own technological terms, but the phenomenon is most associated with the Star Trek franchise. From phase inverters to tachyon beams to EM radiation, a lot of techno babble includes actual scientific terms and principles. Most Star Trek shows have employed a science consultant who ensures that the majority of the science has its roots in reality, although sometimes things fall more into the fiction category uh, of science fiction. Regardless, Star Trek wouldn't be Star Trek without a healthy dose of techno babble, and there's something undeniably endearing about the sometimes nonsensical jargon. Right, so off we go. Number seven Spock, Leonard Nimoy, Zachary Quinto, Ethan Peck. Did they say characters? No, oh, why characters, not actors? Right, so just talking about Spock. All the Spocks. Star Trek original series, J.J. Abrams, pathetic Star Trek movies, and Star Trek Strange New Worlds, which I do like. And there's the great, late, great Leonard Nimoy uh, as Commander Spock uh, in the original series. There he is with uh, Dr. McCoy, uh, who was a Lieutenant Commander, by the way, if you didn't know. Uh, there's Zachary Quinto, Chris Pine in the Pooh movies. There's Ethan Peck as uh, Lieutenant Spock in Strange New Worlds. And there he is. Uh, saying, uh, I want the ship to go now, or whatever he says, something like that, which I didn't mind. Right. Although Star Trek, the original series, did not contain as much techno babble as later Star Trek series, Spock was the character who delivered many of the most jargon-filled lines. As the science officer on the USS Enterprise and second in command, Spock provided his captains, Christopher Pike, Jeffrey Hunter, Anson Mount, and James T. Kirk, William Shatner, with accurate and objective explanations for the various problems and anomalies the ship encountered. Still, the original series tended to keep things simple and did not always provide technical explanations for the solutions Spock or Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott, James Doohan, came up with. Always the logical Vulcan, Spock would often provide exact figures and detailed responses in the name of accuracy. Every version of Spock has had this trait, although the Spock of J.J. Abrams' Star Trek films was a more emotional version of the character, that's putting it lightly. Star Trek 2009 and its two sequels focus more on action than technical lingo, because J.J. Abrams knows sod all about Star Trek. At least he admitted it though. 
But again, when a techno babble line was required, it was often Spock delivering it. Ethan Peck's Lieutenant Spock has his fair share of techno babble lines too, and he even got to sing some of them in the Star Trek Strange New Worlds musical episode, which I didn't mind. A lot of Star Trek fans hate that episode, but I thought we were fine. Uh, maybe they hated the Buffy musical episode as well. You know, that was as, you know, as logical as the Star Trek one. Anyway, note the opening number of Strange New World Subspace Rhapsody, the musical one, includes several characters singing their status report updates as a clever nod to Star Trek's use of techno babble. Right, number six, Lieutenant Commander Data. I was saying in the UK, Lieutenant Commander Data. I think it's falling out of favour now, to be honest. I think most British people now say Lieutenant rather than Lieutenant. I think if they say Lieutenant, being, you know, deliberately British. <laughs> Anyway, Brent Spiner, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, and there he is, uh, Brent Spiner, with uh, Lieutenant Commander Geordie LaForge, uh, and there he is again with Geordie, who was his best friend, uh, and there he is again with Geordie, uh, and there he is with Lieutenant <laughs> Miles O'Brien, that must be from season one, uh, I think that's from... That's from season two, isn't it? Because in season one, Geordie wore red, didn't he? Or maroon, or whatever the colour's called, uh, for command. But he moved, he became chief engineer, didn't he? In season one, the Enterprise had several chief engineers, for some reason. Uh, probably because the ship's that big, I thought, I thought, we need more than one chief engineer. But for some reason, in season two, they decided to get rid of all them and just make Geordie LaForge the chief engineer. Uh, and he was a lieutenant for a while, and I think... I don't, I don't know if it was later in season two or by season three he'd been promoted to Lieutenant Commander. I'm waffling, aren't I? We're supposed to be going on about techno babble, but I just want to look at these pictures. Uh, uh, that's data. I can't remember this episode. Wind Grace will know what episode this is. Is this the uh, bags, ugly bags of mostly water episode? Could be, but it might not be. Right. Uh, I think this is uh, the uh, best of both worlds, I think. Um Yes, I think it is. Right. Uh, with his android positronic brain, Data could perform, perform mathematical equations and process information much faster than any human. Because of this, Data delivered many of the most techno babble heavy lines in Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, by the way, in Next Gen, uh, the, Enterprise, uh, the Enterprise D um, never really had a science officer. Uh, I don't think uh, Voyager did either. Obviously, on Deep Space Nine, they had uh, Dax, uh, Jadzia Dax. She was the science officer of Deep Space Nine. But in Next Gen, they never had a science officer because I think they were they, technically they were all scientists, weren't they? So I didn't think there was any one person in charge of the science department or sciences. They just called on people as they needed them. Anyway. Uh, as the operations officer of the USS Enterprise D, under the command of Captain Jean-Luc Picard, Patrick Stewart, uh, Data was one of the most essential crew members on the ship. Not only did his superior abilities and resistance to disease save the Enterprise on multiple occasions, but he could also remember and recite massive amounts of information. Much like Spock, Data also tended to provide extremely accurate answers, providing a time frame down to the second, and sometimes closer. Excuse me. For example, much to the amusement or annoyance of those around him. Brent Spiner was always great as data and he made even the most techno babble filled lines sound natural. For an android, that is. In Next Generation Season 5, Episode 18, Cause and Effect, awesome episode, one of my faves. For example, the Enterprise got stuck in a time loop. As the crew worked to find a solution, Data posited that if the Decion emission is modulated correctly, it will set up resonances in my positronic subprocessors. Or subprocessors, he said, wouldn't it? He clarifies that this would allow him to send himself a message through the time loops on a subconscious level, which is nonsense, isn't it? I don't even know. Is a Decion a real thing? Don't know. But uh, it sounds... Plausible, and that's the point of techno babble. It's got to sound plausible and not nonsensical or magical. It's got to sound, you know, reasonable within the limits, you know, of the uh, the the law of the series. Which is why sometimes I think in in Discovery, it's it's a lot of it's 
it's magic. It, it's just future magic. But uh, anyway, I'm moaning. Right, number five, Lieutenant Commander Geordie LaForge, LeVar Burton. Star Trek The Next Generation, there he is. Let's look at some pictures. Uh, there he is as Lieutenant Commander Geordie LaForge, Chief Engineer of the Enterprise. Uh, and there he is again uh, in a probably season, well, it must be season two because of the uh, uniforms. Uh, they got the collars in season three and left the jumpsuits behind uh, for some of the crew. <laughs> uh, there he is with Data uh, poking about in his head. Uh, there he is with uh, Wesley Crusher. Will Wheaton. Uh, and there he is, the awesome episode Relics with um, uh, James Doohan as Scotty, when they found Scotty in uh, the USS Janolan's transporter buffer. Uh, and there we go. Right, so beginning in Star Trek The Next Generation Season 2, Geordie LaForge served as the chief engineer on the Enterprise D, and he quickly developed a reputation for being able to solve almost any engineering problem. LaVar, but and it, somehow he, he got this job from being... Um, you know, basically the helmsman of the Enterprise. Uh, something which I think they copied in, um, or kind of copied in the Orville, didn't they? Um, the, the character, the bridge, one of the bridge crew from there ended up becoming the chief engineer. But uh, anyway, from the, the helm. I forgot his bloody name. <sighs> Win Grace, save me. LeVar Burton's ability to make almost any line of techno babble sound conversational came in handy, as LaVarge often had to report on the state of the Enterprise's engines and other systems. Geordie understood the Enterprise D's engines and systems better than anyone, uh, even better than Leah Brahms, who designed them, and it often came down to him and his best friend Data to save the day. In the Next Generation Season 3 episode uh, 7, The Enemy, uh, which I watched quite recently, uh, curiously enough, Geordie found himself trapped on a dangerous planet with a Romulan named Bokra, John Snyder, and he had to reconfigure his own visor uh, to find a way off the planet. As Geordie could not see, he coached Bokra uh, through the process with lines like, make sure the scanner set... Uh, make sure the... See, I can't even do it. Make sure the scanner select limiter matches the visor output range and now place the neural output pods in contact with the tricorder scanner heads. Easy. How hard could it be? LaForge made these lines and many others sound perfectly logical. So if I were Bokka, I'd be like, Eh? <laughs> Can you, have you got a manual? Uh, note, although Commander William Riker, Jonathan Frakes, did not often get in on the techno babble, he did once deliver a hilarious string of fake techno babble to confuse Ferengi pirates in the Next Generation Season 6, Episode 7, Rascals. I don't like that episode. Right, number four, Chief Miles O'Brien, Colin Meany, Star Trek Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, and there he is in his lieutenant uniform. Eh, oh, dear. And there he is as Chief O'Brien on Deep Space Nine with Odo, the late, great René Aubergenois. Uh, and there he is as, uh, from DS9 again. Uh, and there he is in uh, TNG as Chief O'Brien. Note, he's got his... Uh, um, he's a Chief Petty Officer, isn't he? He's got his uh, non-commissioned officer, Pip. Uh, with uh, Lieutenant Barclay, Reg Barclay. And there he is on DS9. Getting a, probably a Raptor Gino from the replicator and sticking his finger in it, is he? Or is he just, or is it just the, the handle for the cup round there? It looks like he's sticking his finger in it. Uh, right. Uh, Chief Miles O'Brien may be Star Trek's everyman, but he, and he's also the most important man in the history of Starfleet, according to uh, Star Trek um, Lower Decks. <laughs> Right, Chief Miles O'Brien may be Star Trek's everyman, but he could deliver techno babble with the best of them. O'Brien served as the transport chief on Star Trek The Next Generation before transferring over to become chief of operations on Star Trek Deep Space Nine, and both roles often required him to spout complex technological jargon. Very few characters could make a line like the one below sound like a normal conversation, but Chief O'Brien managed to pull it off. When discussing what happened to the away team in Deep Space Nine Season 3, Episode 11, Past Tense, Part 1, O'Brien says, The temporal surge we detected was caused by an explosion of a microscopic singularity passing through this solar system. Somehow the energy emitted by the singularity shifted the chroniton particles in our hull into a high state of temporal polarisation. Chroniton particles are often used in Star Trek for like time travel stuff. Uh, 
Kronos is you know, uh, Greek in it for time. Uh, so there we go. This line prompts uh, a confused look from Major Kira Norris, Nana Visitor, before she asks, which means what? O'Brien clarifies that the transporter being passed through polarised particles and transported the away team to a different time period, considering neither time travel nor chronicton particles exist in our world. O'Brien's explanation to Kira was very much appreciated. Throughout his time on Deep Space Nine, O'Brien kept the station up and running. Often without access to the state-of-the-art technology he was used to on the Enterprise D. Uh, this uh, Cardassian monstrosity, often called it, didn't it? Number three, Lieutenant Balana Torres, Roxanne Dawson, Star Trek Voyager. Yeah, remember she used to be Roxanne Biggs Dawson. This must have dropped the Biggs. Uh, and there she is. Uh, she's got different pips because she was a Maquis officer on the Voyager. Uh, and there she is again. Obviously we'll only see her from Voyager because that's all she were in as far as I know. Uh, as a character. Uh, unless she appeared in Prodigy, maybe or Lower Decks at some point. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, since the USS Voyager was stuck uh, light years away from home, the crew often had to come up with unconventional solutions to any problems they faced. Because of this, Star Trek Voyager likely contained the most techno babble out of any Star Trek show, and Chief Engineer Balana Torres was often the one delivering the most jargon filled lines. Still, many members of Voyager's crew often pitched in to help when solving problems, sometimes joining in on the techno babble conversations. The techno babble on Star Trek Voyager began early, when the ship got trapped in a singularity in the only series, in, in only the series's apologies second episode Parallax. The solution to escape involved warp particles and a Decion beam. Remember them, Decions, as well as rerouting the port and starboard plasma flow to the main deflector. Several Voyager officers participated in this particular exchange, including Captain Catherine Janeway, who could also deliver some good techno babble when she wanted to. Kate Mulgrew, all right, was also pretty adept at delivering techno babble. I should read ahead, shouldn't I? <laughs> right, number two, Captain Michael Burnham, Sonequa Martin Green, Star Trek Discovery, uh, and there she is with uh, Saru. Uh, I don't care. I'm not a big fan of Discovery. Uh, but, but I did like season one, oddly enough. Uh, although I do admit it did have its problems. Right, as modern technology and scientific understanding have continued to advance, Star Trek's techno babble has, become, has also become more solidly based in actual science. Star Trek Discovery, in particular, has some of the franchise's best techno babble. No, it doesn't. It's bloody nonsense. At least. You know, classic Trek has techno babble that might be nonsense, but it sounds reasonable. Star Trek Discovery's techno babble is just gobbledygook. It's just, it's just might as well be saying blah, 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 to paraphrase um, uh, Rodney McKay. Anyway, and Sonequa Martin Green excels at delivering even the most complicated lines in a believable way. With its fast paced, more action oriented approach to storytelling, Burnham often has to come up with solutions on the fly. Pardon me. And Martin Green can deliver rapid fire techno babble like no other. I've noticed they haven't given any examples, and I don't think they do, do they? The crew of the USS Discovery is made up of geniuses and experts in their respective fields. And I'm shaking my head as I'm reading this. And Burnham served in the position of Chief Science Officer for a time, having been raised on Vulcan and attended the Vulcan Science Academy. Uh, by the way, she soon lost her Vulcanness, if you notice, if you watch it. When she first came aboard, in season one, it showed her when she first came aboard um, Discovery, she was very Vulcan when Salik brought her aboard. And that backstory to that is also crap, but uh, that's by the by. She was very Vulcan, very emotionless, and then next time you see her, bang, she's crying and laughing and all this stuff. Anyway, Michael has an analytical and logical mind, much like her foster brother Spock. She began her Starfleet career on the USS Shenzhou as a xenoanthropologist, and her knowledge of ancient alien, color, uh, bleh, alien cultures proved useful on numerous occasions. But they don't give any examples because, you know, it's nonsense. Uh, they just they just put this in. Have you noticed the the last two, the top two, two and one, are discovery ones. 
I think uh, the writer of this article is a Discovery fan. I forgot your name again already. Helen, whatever you're called. Let's check. Uh, where is it? Uh, Rachel, sorry. Rachel Hulshult. You're obviously a Discovery fan. But you still can't find any examples, can you? Number one, Commander Paul Stamets, Anthony Rapp, Star Trek Discovery. He started out as a lieutenant. I think he's, is he, I'm sure he's lieutenant commander. I don't think he's a full commander, is he? But anyway. I don't know, and I don't care. Commander Paul Stamets focused his study on alien fungi, 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 whatever. So he has a better understanding of the USS Discovery's spore drive and the mycelial network than anyone. More nonsense. Other people keep saying, no, no, it's true. Paul Stamets was a real scientist who knew all about mushrooms. That don't make it that don't make it so that you can't transport yourself anywhere by eating mushrooms, can you? Not physically. <laughs> As one of the smartest officers on a ship full of geniuses. See! Oh Rachel, you're doing me head in. Stamets excels at math. Which means maths. And science, and often comes up with out of the box solutions to the problems Discovery faces. Stamets, Michael Burnham, and Lieutenant Sylvia Tilly, Mary Wiseman, regularly bounce ideas off of one another. The power of math, people. God, I bloody hate it. In dialogue exchanges full of techno babble, Anthony Rapp has a particular gift for delivering those jargon filled lines and making them sound believable. No examples. After Discovery arrived 900 years in the future in Star Trek Discovery Season 3, the ship's crew faced entirely new sets of problems. Despite being 900 years behind, Stamets and the crew caught on quickly. <sighs> I hate it. I've said, I've said it before and i say it again. It's like if a, a crew of a Viking longboat... <laughs> Suddenly arrived now. <sighs> and started bossing us around. It basically took over. It basically took over. That's what it'd be like. Unbelievable. <sighs> and their knowledge, experience and skills help reinvigorate the Federation of the future. What were left of it. Regardless of whether... They've just ruined, they've ruined Star Trek in that regard, in my opinion. But whatever. Regardless of whether the science holds up in the real world, it doesn't. Star Trek's techno babble, uh, Star Trek Discovery's techno babble, has always depended on internal logic. Techno babble helps make the universe of Star Trek feel a little more realistic and lived in, and makes that ideal version of the future feel a little more possible. And remember, when all else fails, try reversing the polarity of the deflector array, you know, or um, mutate the uh, shield modulation. Uh, or modulate the shield mutation, or whatever it is, something like that. Uh, and rerouting power from the auxiliary systems to the plasma manifold. Yes, there. That is another one. Uh, but she didn't give any examples, did she, from the from Discovery? You know why? Because it's all nonsense. It's magic in Star Trek Discovery. Uh, it doesn't have any grounding in actual science. But time crystals are real. No, they're not. Not in the sense that we saw him in Star Trek Discovery. Right, so there we go. That's the list. So, they put two two Discovery ones at the top. If that's if it is that sort of a list. Maybe it's not. Maybe, maybe they're not in any order. <laughs> or maybe they're in reverse order. That's how I'll say it. Right, so there we go. So, that's, that's the end of another list. So, there we go. So, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. Now, we'll get rid of that. And I'll make myself big again. Uh, wherever I put it. Where have I put it? It's my dosh, there we go. And where am I? Where am I? I'm there. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I'm all over the place. I'm still fighting this cold that I've had. Uh, I'm nearly better, but uh, my son's caught it now, so I've got to put up with him moaning about it. But never mind. Right, so, I think everybody in the world seems to have got it. The neighbours have heard them coughing. <laughs> but that's bad, bad. Um, right, so, maybe we need some techno babbly Star Trek Doctor to come in and save us. Right, we'll leave it there. So, thanks for watching, wherever you are, look after each other, and until next time, I'll see thee.